Okay. Um, welcome, everyone, to this uh, first online meeting of uh, Beyond Space Time. Uh, we're very happy to have as our guest today, Eric Curiel. Before he gets started, I have two items of business. The first one is to explain to everybody the rules of how we're going to do that. So first of all, uh, everybody should please mute their microphone, uh, and that should be muted all the time, except for when you're called upon, uh, uh, except for the speaker, of course. Uh, the meeting is going to be recorded uh, and will be made available on our YouTube uh, channel later on. Uh, it's also actually now live streaming on our YouTube uh, channel, uh, that is the Beyond Space Time channel. Uh, the way this is going to work is uh, Eric will be giving a talk of about 45 to no more than 60 uh, minutes. Uh, as, and then we will have a discussion of up to 45 minutes. For the discussion, uh, you can use the raise hand uh, function in Zoom, or you can use the chat, which I will also uh, be reading, where you can say you have a question, or if you have a finger, there's no finger function on Zoom, so if you have a finger on something that's been said or been asked, uh, you have to indicate that on the uh, in the chat function. I will then call on you and please only unmute your microphone at that point. Okay, good, great. So this is the first meeting as I've said, but actually we will have another uh, meeting next Wednesday um, uh, in a later time slot, which will be announced uh, uh, shortly. Nick, did you want to say something right, uh, about this right now? Sure. Actually, it's not much later. It's at 9.30. And, I mean, it's a quarter of an hour later, so 9.30 oh, in right. Chicago. Um, and it's Andrew Garassi from a physicist from Northwestern um, who's going to be talking about some of the tabletop searches for dark matter, but also um, tabletop searches for, um, quantum, for gravi quantum gravity interference effects that um, he, and another, he and a group have been proposing. Um, but it's all on the website, so... Um, you can find the details there. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, so I come to the second order of business, which is uh, the immense pleasure of introducing today's speaker. Uh, Eric did an undergraduate degree uh, at Harvard, uh, a joint uh, uh, major in physics and philosophy before he moved to the University of Chicago, where he did his PhD in philosophy under the joint supervision of David Malament and Howard Stein. Uh, he uh, has published in many top journals in both physics and philosophy, and recently I've seen uh, also in in in, in popular science uh, magazines and popular science outlets. Uh, he works uh, mainly in philosophy of physics, um, in most of philosophy of physics, as far as I can tell, uh, in space-time physics, quantum field theory and curved space-time, as we will see today, uh, on cosmology, uh, statistical mechanics, thermodynamics, uh, quantum gravity, uh, so quite a, a wide range uh, within philosophy of physics but he also works and connects that work to bigger topics and questions in the general philosophy of science, um, having to do with, with, with uh, uh, um, the status of theories, confirmation, modeling, and, and many other topics there. He is currently uh, um, the holder of, um, of a grant from the uh, uh, German um, uh, research agency, the DFG, uh, where he is the single PI, and uh, it's the second of uh, these grants that he's received, uh, uh, big grants, and uh, so his uh, primary affiliation for, I understand, 10 months of the year is at the LMU in Munich, 
For the remaining two months of the year, he is uh, at Harvard and works with the Black Hole Initiative there. Uh, before these positions, uh, he held postdoc positions at the University of Chicago, Stanford, the University of Pittsburgh, the London School of Economics, and Western Ontario. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Eric, who will be uh, talking to us today on the cogency of quantum field theory on curved spacetime and semi-classical gravity. Please, Eric. So, uh Chris, thank you very much for that very generous uh, and very kind introduction. Um, just to, for the sake of accuracy, I, I should point out, I never held a postdoc at University of Chicago. I got my PhD there, and I did teach a course there, but I, nev I, did never, hold, I never held a postdoc there. Uh, but uh, otherwise, sounded pretty accurate. Next. So, oh, uh, before I start, I should ask, so um, no, I normally under, you know, under normal circumstances when we're all in the same room, you know, live action, I invite people to interrupt the, the talk to ask clarif uh, clarificatory questions, not substantive questions. Uh, Chris, do you want to allow that uh, procedure or should people just save all questions for the end? Uh, yes, if there are clarificatory questions and clarificatory questions only please during the talk, please indicate that uh, in the uh, chat function and I will then get Eric's attention and give you the word. Okay, great, thank you. So as the title of the talk indicates, I'll be talking about quantum field theory and curved space time today and its extension or, gen or perhaps generalizations and classical gravity. And um, during the introduction, I, I hope to convince you that this is a very important issue, a very important uh, general problem figuring out exactly what these theories or frameworks are and what the issues that face them are in their applications. I, I hope to convince you that, that this is a very important field of work that philosophers sh uh, should be engaged in more. Uh, wait, what the hell is going on here? There we go. So um, I'll begin by giving a, a brief uh, cursory sketch in outline form of the two theories or frameworks. I think uh, just for the ease, for simplicity, I'll, I'll try to refer to them just as frameworks. I don't think a lot, nothing really hinges on the distinction between a theory and a framework insofar as there, there is such a clean distinction in the first place. Nothing really hinges on that for this talk. So for simplicity, I think I'll just call them frameworks. Um, not intending thereby any deep philosophical uh, meaning or implication. So I'll begin by sketching, uh, sketching them. Uh, saying a little bit about how they're used, why they're so cool, and posing what I see as the fundamental problem that faces them, move on to their discontents, which, ascent, which really is a, a working out in some detail of all of the, of a plethora of individual uh, problems that one in some sense can consider to be um, individual instances of the, of, the, of the grand problem that I state in the, first, in the in conclusion of the first section. There is, in some sense, an obvious response, which you'll very often hear, especially from physicists, to many of the problems that I'll list and discuss in the discontent section, which is, who cares? So what? This is, a, this is an effective field. This is an effective field. This is an effective framework. Effective frameworks have all kinds of problems. It's not, a, we don't, it's not a fundamental theory. We don't think it's a fundamental theory. It has problems, big deal. When we get our, when we get our fundamental theory, those problems should be, one expects them to be resolved. I don't think that's a satisfying attitude to take. And um, I will try to say why. And I'll then conclude with a few very programmatic remarks about what I think the appropriate attitude to take in this kind of situation is. Okay, so let's start by thinking about general relativity. It is unquestionably one of our, I would say, three best physical theories. It is valid from you know, middling to largest spatial and temporal scales and from near perfect vacuum to super dense, ma to super dense uh, matter distributions. It implements a dynamical space-time geometry, which I'm sure everyone here I'm sure knows. Them. So, I'm going to be presuming quite a lot of background technical knowledge about both GR and quantum field theory. If 
you do have questions um, about particular claims I make that may be too arcane or obscure, please do, inter please do interrupt and I'll clarify. I've tried to keep the uh, really serious technical detail to a minimum, but it's, it's sometimes hard to gauge that when you're in the middle of you know, frenetically, frantically writing slides. Okay, so GR, uh, valid dynamical space time, no quantum effects. GR is a, is a purely classical theory, classical in the sense of nothing quantum about it. It does, however, manifest, at least in principle, it is possible for extreme causal weirdness to, uh, to manifest, which in a sense seems to be inconsistent with quantum mechanics that lies at the heart of the information loss paradox. The, um, the fact that we can, that evaporating black hole space times that their, their causal structure seems to be, let's say problematic, if not pathological in the sense that it has no, that, they, that there's no Cauchy horizon is lies at the heart of why it is that it seems as though unitarian evolution of the quantum field cannot be implemented through the entirety of the space time. That's the heart of the, of the standard information loss paradox. Quantum field theory is the second of our best theories. It treats, rather than treating space-time structure and uh, gravity in, in scare quotes, as GR does, it rather treats matter. It's valid for matter in the ordin ordinary sense, you know, tabletops. At least in some sense, it treats tabletops. It's valid for atomic and smaller matter at smallest spatial and temporal scales and for highest and lowest energies. It is formulated against a static flat space-time geometry. It, involved, it does not include any treatment of gravity. And it's worth noting that that claim that it doesn't include um, any contributions from gravity does not follow from the fact that it is formulated against a static flat space-time geometry. Um, it's, a, it's actually quite nice that, uh, that, that Brian Pitts is, um, is here because I think he'll be most friendly to, the, to, this, uh, uh, to, uh, to, the, to this distinction. It is, one can, in fact, try to incorporate gravity in the standard quantum field theory by, you know, by, by using standard perturbative te techniques, so-called soft gravitons, and stuff like, you know, little fancy pants, stuff like that. But standard quantum field theory, our stand, you know, uh, the, the standard model of particle physics does not include gravity. But that is not a consequence of the fact that it's formulated against a static class based on geometry. And QFT also, you know, ha includes in some, uh, some forms of extreme quantum weirdness that does seem inconsistent with general relativity, I should say it's not clear to me that entanglement actually is, it, entanglement, which seems to me one of the, one of the most, if not the most characteristic, characteristic quantum phenomenon, it's not clear to me that, that's, that that actually is in any way inconsistent or even in tension with anything in general relativity. It's superposition that really seems to be the problem in trying to fit quantum mechanics into general, into general relativity. It's not clear, for instance, what it might mean to talk about superposed causal structures, superposed classical causal structures. So it's perhaps surprising to learn, given that there are these prima facie at least tensions, if not outright inconsistencies between the two theories. And given the fact that they are each valid and extraordinarily good in widely separated uh, physical regimes, that there is in fact a consistent rigorous theory of quantum fields on relativistic space times of the algebraic or axiomatic formulations. One uh, fixes a, ba a background classical space time geometry and then treats the quantum fields, um, non interacting quantum fields, propagating against this, the, this fixed background. One treats them as test matter, free fields. They, they, their, test, their test, in a sense, that the fixed background geometry um, is not sensitive to it. The, the fixed background geometry, uh, it, whatever, whatever stress energy there may be that enters into the left-hand side of the Einstein field equation, it includes no contributions from these quantum fields. That's the sense in which it is test matter. It, there are also um, standard canonical Lagrangian formulations of QFT on CST but they're really messy and they raise yet more mathematical and physical problems. I'll discuss a few of those at the very end. Um, and some results are known for interacting in quantum fields in the algebraic framework, but nothing really of interest, I think. They're, for, they're, restric they're restricted to the best of my knowledge as of, I haven't checked the literature in the last year, but as of at least a year ago, they were restricted to um, two, dimen two dimensional space times with, uh, and the fields had really, really unphysical properties. 
so we had free fields. We had a perfectly rigorous, very, really quite beautiful, in fact, theory of QFT on CST, only for free test fields. But you know, ask ask a lot of people. You know, that unrestricted freedom is kind of scary. So let's restrict, let's shackle our fields by including back reaction, and this give, this leads to the framework of semi-classical gravity. When I say include back reaction, what I mean is we are now going to couple the quantum fields to the space-time geometry by way of, by using what's uh, the so-called semi-classical Einstein field equation, and that consists of it has it looks very similar in form to the, Einstein, to the classical Einstein field equation, uh, as perhaps is not surprising. The left-hand side consists of the classical Einstein tensor, so classical space-time geometry. Still, we have that. The right-hand side, however, now consists of the expectation value of the, of the stress energy tensor as a quantum operator. So the quantum field is going to source the space-time geometry. So in, in, in QFT and CST, the quantum field is sensitive to the space-time geometry in that how it evolves depends on the space-time curvature, but space-time curvature does not depend on the distribution of the quantum field. Now, the, the direction of, uh, what's the word, I'm losing words. The direction of dependence, that's it, goes in both directions. The quantum field is sensitive to the background space-time geometry in that the background space-time the curvature um, informs and constrains how the field evolves, but the, the classical geometry is also sensitive now to the quantum field, and that the, the stress energy content of the quantum field in this rather slightly odd, as we'll see, sense contributes in what looks like a, the, the fairly the, the standard way in GR to the to the curvature of this of the space-time geometry. There's no completely rigorous mathematical theory of semi-classical gravity. Um, we have um, all the standard formulations, the Lagrangian formulation, S matrix, path intervals, canonical. They are all re really just fully perturbative and with, the with all the warts and other unsightly blemishes that go, that, and that go along with it. I'm not, I'm not, except for one remark I'll make later in the talk, I'm gonna put aside all of the standard problems that accrue to having such a perturbative formulation. The standard problems, so semi-classical gravity uh, you know, inherits all of the standard problems from, from standard quantum field theory, from, from perturbative form, uh, formulations of standard quantum field theory. All of the mathematical um, lack, the, the lack of rigor, the lack of clarity, the, prob the problematical issues of renormalization, that's all inherited. And, I'm not, and so let's just take those as given and not worry about them because we do just fine with them in place in standard quantum field theory. I'm gonna be examining problems that really are peculiar to these, these formulations of quantum field theory in, spa, in, in curved space times where the coupling is given by the semi-classical Einstein field equation. So now we, have, now we face the fundamental question, which as, I, which as I say, I claim the rest, all the problems in the remainder of the talk will in some sense or other be special cases of, or uh, articulate, uh, yeah, I, think, I think that works. How does the sober, rigorous, and precise Apollonian convocation of classical Lorentzian geometry and the exuberantly inexact and informal Dionysian Fandango of quantum field theory come into mutually fruitful contact so as to give the joy of material content to the former and the restrained discipline of consistent structure to the latter? GR is this incredibly beautiful, perfectly well-defined, mathematically, con mathematically consistent, rigorous theory. QFT is this messy mushigus of, math of quasi-mathematical crap, but somehow, but somehow it works like gangbusters. Nothing works so well. And somehow or other, we're, spo we're supposed to figure out how the two of them can make, con can make contact given the radical disparities in form and in content between them. So let's say even in radical disparities in style and tempo between them. And this question I think is especially urgent in light of the fact that 
as I say, first of all, the theories are prima facie and mutually inconsistent in this, in this one particular way. And yet black hole thermodynamics is formulated in these frameworks. And DHT is the most widely accepted, deeply trusted set of purely theoretical propositions in all of physics. It is in fact trusted so much that it is seen as our best guide to, to trying to uh, formulate an adequate uh, theory of quantum gravity. And all of this, even though we have absolutely no empirical access to any of the physical regimes in which we would expect the effects of QFT, CSD, or SCG to manifest themselves, to, to become um, non-negligible. So all of this with no empirical access, much less with any empirical support then. It, the results of BHT in particular and semi-classical gravity techniques in general have ramified into almost every discipline in physics, far, going far outside the original, uh, the, the, the original uh, arena of space-time gravitational physics. Te uh, techniques, arguments, results, inspired by BHT are now used widely and commonly in fluid dynamics, in condensed matter physics, in, co well, in, cosmo in cosmology, more, all, all forms of cosmology, in uh, laser optics, you name it, some discipline of physics these days, results from BHT are being used in it. And yet, because of the character, because of the character, the, uh, the characteristics that I've mentioned so far, all the investigations that take place in DHT and QFT, CSD, and SEG, and all and all, all of the al the whole alphabet soup that goes that goes along with it, are necessarily speculative in a way unusual even in theoretical physics. We are faced here with very technically sophisticated physical questions that are inextricable from subtle philosophical considerations that span ontology, epistemology, methodology, and again, in a way unusual even in theoretical physics. Why do we trust these frameworks at all? Well, I'm going to, I hope, um, if you are complacent about these frameworks and think that they're just jolly and we should, and we have no, and that everything's, everything's cool and groovy with them, I hope uh, to, sh to, to shake you out of your dogmatic slumbers to wake you from your dogmatic slumbers in the next 20 minutes or so. So I'm, I'm just going, this section really will just simply be a catalog of problems. Some of them I'll stop and work through at greater length. Some of them I'll just kind of mention and move on. So the first is the problem, and there'll be a mixture of, of just purely technical mathematical problems, some, phys some problems of physical conception, and then more, ge more general philosophical conceptual problems. I'm not making any real uh, attempt to distinguish all of them because in my mind, again, as, I, as I've intimated, this, is th this part of physics is one where in fact, those three categories of problems are almost never cleanly distinct, are never cleanly separable from each other. So there's first the problem with the stress energy operator. So you give me um, a quantum field theory, you give me a quantum, a quantum field theory in curved space time and I ask you to define the, the self-adjoint operator, you know, in the best of cases bounded, but you, know, you can't always get what you want. That is, that represents the stress energy. That is, that is, that, that is, the, is the quantum analog, the quantum, the quantum observable that is the analog of classical stress energy. So I want to know what it is mathematically. I want to know what its physical significance is. And I want to know in particular what its expectation value means because its expectation value is what enters the right-hand side of the semi-classical Einstein field equation. As we'll see, there are, uh, the problem is, 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 is manifold actually. I say the problem with the stress energy operator, there are actually several sub-problems. There are, first of all, many different ways to define it. Um, not all of them are rigorous or, or even just tolerably clear. They, not all of them are available in all space times of interest. And when there are, when there is more than one available, they tend, they actually almost always give different values for each other. And, but they all seem to have some both mathematical and physical motivation behind them. So it's difficult to see why one should choose one over the other. So first of all, I should mention that, that there are 
in, or, in ordinary quantum field theory on Minkowski spacetime, on, on flat, you know, flat static spacetime, there is there are well-defined methods for constructing a, a, a self-adjoint operator that, that in a clear sense represents the stress, ener the, the stress energy content of the quantum fields. But none of, none of those standard techniques are available in, in curved space times. And all of these uh, primarily uh, severe technical problems arise and they're all grounded in the presence of space time curvature. They, Loosely speaking, the problems are that there, that there are no rigorous localization procedures for defining the, op for defining the operator as a, distri a distribution valued, um, dis uh, an a distribution valued field on the, on Minkowski, on the, on the space time, I'm sorry. What you, you, what you end up getting is either unbounded operators or operators that are not self-adjoint. You, you, you can never get, you can never get bounded self-adjoint operators. And when you do get, when you get self-adjoint operators that are unbounded, you, there are well-known techniques and standard quantum field theory for, for dealing with that. You look, you, 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 can, you construct standard extent, you construct extensions and um, impose regularization procedures, but none of, but none of those are available in curved space time for the, for similar reasons. You generically have no time like killing field. So you have, um, it, trying to think of uh, stress energy as being composed of energy components and energy momentum components and momentum momentum components, uh, which is how, how one standardly can, which is one standard technique used for constructing the stress energy operator is a non-starter. What one means by parallel transport of vectors is of course ambiguous in a curved space time. So what, as a consequence, one cannot uh, write down the, the canonical expectation diagrams for trying to calculate the expectation values, even if one has a stress energy tensor in hand. So all the standard techniques for defining the operator and calculating expectation values fail. Still, there are many techniques now available for defining the operator and calculating the expectation value. Um, I'll just give you a list without telling you what they are. Just my point here is just to tell you, it's just to drive home the fact that there are many of them, all, uh, most, re most quite different from each other. There's the proper time regularization, dimensional regularization, zeta function regularization, point splitting regularization, which comes in both the Hadamard and the non-Hadamard uh, versions, adiabatic regularization, trace anomaly cancellation, Gaussian approximation of the propagator, and there, there are more, but these, are, these seven are, I think, far and away the most widely used ones. But again, there are two problems here. One is that not all of these are available in all space times. Most of them require particular, uh, particular symmetries to be present, um, either, you know, uh, uh, off, often they require that space-time be stationary. Sometimes they require that, uh, uh, that the, that the space-times implement um, some kind of axial rotational symmetry. But uh, um, some of them at least require that the space-times be asymptotically flat and have uh, the appropriate asymptotic, uh, appropriate asymptotic symmetries. But of course, you don't always have that. And even when you do have, as I remarked before, even when you are in a space-time in which more than one of these procedures is available, it is generically the case that they will give you stress energy, that they will give you operators that are not equal to each other with no good way of deciding which one one should choose. Then there's the problem that uh, for whatever reason has been troubling me the most recently. This is the problem of semi-classical coupling. What justification, if any, can there be for the form of the semi-classical Einstein field equation? Why should classical geometry couple to the expectation value of the operator in the semi-classical approximation? In, in sta all standard interpretations, all interpretations pretty much really that I know of quantum field theory, of ex an expectation value represents an average of a set of possible experimental outcomes. So does the semi-classical Einstein field equation, uh, is it assuming that cl classical geometry effectively acts as a continual measurement probe of the quantum field, I don't even know what that can mean. So it's what, what justification can there be for classical geometry, for the the effect that the quantum field has on the classical geometry, is to be completely contained in the expectation value of this operator. I'll ha I'll have much more to say about that when I come when we come to the so what. Uh, section in a, in a little while. So there's 
the problem of the regime of applicability, when is this a good approximation? How can we justify the use of the approximation when we want to use it? Well, the regime of applicability of effective field theories, and that's what people generally uh, view these two frameworks as, the, the, there's in some sense, in some sense of the term, they are effective field theories, is normally circumscribed by energy scales or equivalently by, you know, uh, by frequency scales, temporal scales, spatial scales. But that's not the case here. Insofar as one can work out under what's under what like barely minimal, barely minimal conditions of adequacy for the application of the for the uh, viable application of this approximation. The most, the most severe circumscription of this regime is imposed, in fact, by the coherence of the state of the quantum field. Of course, everyone expects that the approximation would break down as you approach Planckian energies or Planckian spatial or temporal scales. But this, this, condi this uh, condition, this criterion I'm talking about right now, the coherence of the state of the quantum field, is a much stronger restriction because that can happen arbitrarily far away from Planckian scales. So here, here's, a, here's a simple example. Um, this is one that um, I, I worked out in conversation with Bob Gerovich. So some, some, da, some, some dastard, dastardly scientist, as, as, they, as they always are, for some reason has planted an enormous bomb at the center of the earth. And the trigger of the bomb is attached to a, 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 particle, a particle detector that is rigged up to a vacuum to a container that is in an almost perfect vacuum, except at a given moment you throw in a, you throw in a free neutron into the container. So the half life of the neutron is about you know, uh, about what five minutes something like that. So the moment you throw that neutron into the container, the stress energy of the Earth immediately splits into uh, immediately uh, becomes super uh, superposition of ordinary Earth stays as it is. Oh, I should say, and the experiment is, you leave the thing hooked up for five minutes. After five minutes, if the neutron hasn't, in fact, um, decayed, then, then, you, then, you, remove, then you, you turn the bomb off. So immediately, the, the Earth splits, uh, becomes a superposition of half normal Earth. The stress energy distribution is half normal Earth, half widely distributed fragments of Earth. The, the expectation value of that, stress, of that stress energy is wildly different than it was just before you threw the neutron in. So if the semi-classical Einstein field equation were valid in, on these scales, and nothing, in, nothing intrinsic to the framework says it's not, then one should expect that as soon as they throw the neutron into the, um, into the detection chamber, the moon just wildly veers off you know, in, in, in a different direction. And pretty much all of us, in fact, shoot off the surface of the Earth because you know, we're, we're, we're really no longer, the, the gravitational field of the Earth has, has radically changed. The, the, the local space-time curvature has radically changed because the expectation value of the Earth's stress energy has radically changed. Clearly, no, no, no sane human being believes that will happen if I throw the neutron into the chamber. So the, the lesson seems to be that no matter what else is the case, the Semi-classical gravity is, is valid as an approximation only when, in some sense, the, the state of the quantum field at issue is a highly coherent state. And highly coherent, by that I mean something like the, 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 expecta the expectation value of the stress energy tensor operator is sharply peaked around the most probable quantum, um, around the most probable quantum states. There's not a lot of, dis there's not a lot of dispersion. But that's extremely difficult, I should say, to make precise. I've, I, I've, had, I've had conversations with a lot of really smart people about this, trying, like with Garoch, um, with Daniel Uriti, with, um, with Bob Wald, with Bill Inru, with uh, Aaron Wall. And none of a, in none of those conversations have we been able to come up with anything remotely like a, a clean statement of what kind of coherence is required for the approximation to be good. So I think that's a very difficult problem. Then there's the problem of conformal freedom. How can these 
semi-classical, I'll just call it semi-classical equation. It's, uh, the, 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 the full name is going to be too much of a mouthful. How can the semi-classical equation appropriately constrain the conformal structure of the geometry when only the expectation value of the, op of the stress energy is used? So in other words, all information about correlations is wiped out. I'll explain exactly what's this problematic in more detail in a moment. Correlatively, is the metric curvature of the classical geometry consistently and cogently defined given that the Ricci curvature is determined by quantum effects by the expectation of the value of this operator, but the vial curvature, the conformal structure, seems to be determined as in the purely classical case. You know, point by point, the vial tensor is completely independent of, of stress energy distribution. Only the, the Einstein tensor is, complete, is completely determined by and completely determines Ricci curvature. The Einstein tensor says, in no way, point by point, constrains the value of the vial tensor. But wait, there's more. Vial is, in fact, not completely independent of stress energy. If you uh, consider the, the Bianchi identities in combination with, with the Einstein field equation, you get this nifty relation between the divergence of the vial tensor and gradients of the stress energy. So point by point, the vial curvature is classical, but its divergence in some way seems to be sensitive to gradients of the, um, of the stress energy of the quantum field. So it, it's, it's beginning to look very difficult to get a coherent picture of what vial curvature is supposed to be here. One way to try to make that a little more precise, I'm, I, I, won't go, I won't try to make it very precise, I don't have time, but to throw, to throw out a, a start about how to make this, this concern, this worry that I'm talking about more, more precise. Note that vial knows about stress energy in the classical, uh, in the classical case, only through strictly local variations. Its divergence is, is equal to a certain combination of gradients of the stress energy. So there's a prima facie inconsistency then in, in the case of quantum fields, in the case of the semi-classical framework. But on the one hand, non-local vacuum correlations, fluctuations and particle creation from back reaction, those are all non-local phenomena, but which in some sense, they, are, they, are, they characterize the state of the stress energy of the quantum field. And in some sense, the, the, gradients of, the gradients of the stress energy should be sensitive, should record information about these non-local phenomena. And yet, the conformal curvature being strictly classical can't, doesn't know about that at all, and yet should know about it. So it's very difficult to really get a grip on what the conformal curvature should be in this framework. At least why, formally, of course, I can write it down, but why and whether it has, it has real physical significance, whether it's, it's being sensitive to and responsive to the kinds of things it should be, is not clear at all. There's a, there's a related problem, um, the problem of causal structure. Is there inconsistency between the idea that there's a well-defined background causal geometry, let's say, for black, in the case of black holes, say, a, in particular, a true event horizon, and many pictures of Hawking radiation, such as tunneling, that seem to depend on propagation of fluctuations from inside the event horizon to outside. This is one special case of the way in which quantum stress energy seems to be decoupled in a problematic way from the causal structure as encoded in the, in the, bio, in the bio tensor. Another correlative problem in the same, in the same vein is that given that derivatives of the causal structure, the divergence of the vial tensor, are related to the derivatives of you know, great, the quantum fluctuations of field degrees of freedom, even if only the form of expectation values, one might worry that there's some quantum uncertainty being introduced to the, into the null cone structure. And in fact, uh, some people see this as not a problem, but in fact, a virtue. There are um, a lot of, just in the past year or two, there have been several incredibly interesting proposals for so-called tabletop experiments to, to, to probe uh, some mesoscopic scale gra uh, quantum gravity effects. And they're all based on exactly this idea that in fact, semi-classically, there are reasons to believe that e even at the semi-classical level, there are reasons to believe that some quantum uncertainty is being introduced in the null cone structure. So you may view this as problematic. W wait, this seems to violate the assumptions I'm making in formulating the framework in the first place. So is this a coherent framework? 
or one can view it as a, a, as a great uh, potential virtue. Wow, this may give me a way to probe some larger scale uh, quantum properties of the gravitational field itself. Then there's the problem of energy condition violations. Given that QFT, CST generically violates all the known energy conditions with orgiastic abandon, and that they are essentially that they are the essential ingredient in all the most important and deepest theorems in classical GR, what happens to the results of those theorems in the semi-classical regime? In the semi-classical regime, I mean, uh, it seems as though in in semi-classical gravity, one has essentially none of the fundamental theorems that one knows and loves and makes use of and calls upon all the time in classical GR. Theorems about the cause the causality hierarchy. The existence of well-posed initial value formulations, geodesic theorems, singularities, a, a zillion theorems about black holes, max, the existence of maximal global hyperbolic extensions, theorems about cosmological structure, the generalized second law, top, you know, topological restrictions, and on and on and on. The, the lack of, um, and the fact that all the initial conditions are violated also seems to leave open, correlatively seems to leave open the possibility that essentially any pathology can arise even in the presence of the most boring, ordinary, quantum field, you know, closed timeline curves, naked singularities, ineffaceable Cauchy horizons, wormholes, superluminal propagation, topology change, and so on. So just to, just to get a sense of how severe this problem may be, think about Hawking radiation for a minute. So Hawking radiation necessarily violates the null energy condition. But essentially, every single black hole theorem in classical GR that is used in black hole thermodynamics to characterize Hawking radiation depends on the null energy condition. I won't, I won't list you know, all, all, of the, all of the theorems that depend on the null energy condition, but you, know, you skim them yourself. But every single one plays a role in, in characterizing some important property of Hawking radiation. But we have absolutely no reason to believe that any, any of them actually hold true when there's Hawking radiation. There's something, there's something fishy going on here. There are a few, I'll just list a few, uh, a few more prima facie worries and possible inconsistencies before I move on to the so what phase of the talk. So, um, I mean, first of all, I think it's important to note that the naive combination of quantum field theory and general relativity can fail miserably. You know, the cosmological constant just from flat-footed calculation of vacuum fluctuations gives an answer that's, ten, that's approximately 10 to 120 orders of magnitude wrong, uh, off. I mean, by that, you know, by, by comparison, you know, 17th century vortex theories of gravity and phlogiston are paragons of scientific success. We, if, if we're taking QFT and CST seriously, we should, we should still be taking vortex theories and phlogiston seriously, because they are a lot better theories, it seems, than we get from flat-footed combinations of QFT and GR. There are generically, if you try to solve the, the semi-classical equation using standard Lagrange, uh, perturbative techniques and say the Lagrangian framework, you generically get wild instabilities and, um, and immediate and um, non renormalizable divergences in solutions. So it's extremely difficult to extract physically meaningful secure predictions from the semi-classical equation. And there are other reasons to, to, to think that besides the failure of energy conditions, there are other reasons to think that in this context, some of the standard theorems that we know and love and call upon all the time may not work, I still may not work. Even if you could fix the energy condition problem, there are still reasons to think that they may not work. So no hair, uh, no hair theorems fail for non-abelian gauge theories, but you know, that, that's just standard quantum field theory. They are non-abelian gauge theories. Well, except for, you know, other magnetism, but every, everything else is a non-abelian gauge theory. So we don't, we don't have not, we don't have no hair theorems, but that's, no hair theorems are at the heart of black hole thermodynamics. Again, in black hole thermodynamics, generically, um, we don't, we don't have causality conditions uh, because evaporating black hole space times under very, under very weak conditions can be shown to violate um, causal continuity. But all, but, also, but all those kinds of causality conditions are assumed and used in standard applications of semi-classical approximation in BHT, in the calculation of cosmological perturbations, say in the spectrum of the background cosmic microwave background radiation in models of inflation. And of course, all of these also use unitary evolution, but the, the calculation of the cosmological perturbations and, and the models of inflation. But, we, but there's a real issue about whether unitarity holds in, in this framework. 
as infamously posed by the information loss paradox. So Chris, um, according to my stopwatch, I've been talking for 38 minutes. Uh, so I, um, I will keep on going for probably another eight or nine minutes if that's okay. Yes, that's absolutely okay. Okay, thanks. Well, so I'm just giving you, I'm just giving you a whole boatload of problems. And your first reaction may be to shrug and say, so what? It's just an effective field theory. Why get fussed about all these problems anyway? And indeed, some of you use this fact that it is an EFT to, art, to specifically argue that the, at least the problems that I mentioned just at the end of the previous section about the instability and the divergences and the causal pathology will appear only as one approaches the Planck scale and no one expects the semi-classical approximation to be valid there anyway. So at least those problems we can safely ignore because this is an effective field theory. Those arguments, even, even putting aside the worries about the soundness of those arguments, the ones that I just mentioned that people actually have explicitly put forward to try to uh, defang the worries about instability, divergences, and causal pathology. And I, so even putting those aside, being, and I think it is quite charitable to put them aside, because those arguments really are not, on my, on my, to my judgment, they're not very good arguments. There are a lot of, there are a lot of leaks that have to be plugged in order to make, I, I think, to make, to make those really solid arguments. There remain all the other problems that I raised so far that, that no one in the literature ever addresses or talks about. So let's look more closely, in fact, if, we, if by treating semi-classical gravity as an effective field, field theory, we may be able to mitigate uh, the worry that some, of these, that some of the other problems seem to raise. So there are, in fact, so I, I, sh I should say, by the way, um, what I'm about to present, the next, uh, the, this discussion um, about EFT is some ex very, very recent work I've done. Uh, this is the first time I'm presenting it. So please be harsh and brutal. Uh, I, uh, this is stuff that I have not seen discussed anywhere in the physics or the philosophy literature, and it's very recent work. So um, I'm sure it needs a lot of, uh, it, I'm sure it needs a lot of help. And I, I, I hope y'all can give me that help. So that the geometry is, played, is treated classically, in particular, that um, no, there is no, there is no uh, treatment of any or attribution of any internal or micro quantum degrees of freedom, suggests at least two different ways to try to actually I mean, treat semi-classical gravity as an effective field theory. Because I, um, I should say, you, you will quite often see the claim in the literature, oh, semi-classical gravity, it's effective field theory. I, I think I can, I can count on the fingers of one hand articles I've seen in which people actually try to say what that really means. And all five of those articles are written by essentially by basically the same guy doing the same thing. So, and it's actually kind of cool, but it's, I'm, it's, not, it's still not clear to me really how well it works. But anyway, it seems that there are, are two ways to do this. The first way is to, treat, is, is to say that the quantum field is coupling to a coarse grained environment that, the, that cl the, cl the classical space-time geometry effectively is a coarse grained environment. That's the, the reason why we're not the reason why we're not treating the micro the micro or quantum degrees of freedom of gravity is because we've coarse grained them out, and we now and the quantum field is coupling to this coarse grained environment. This is a very standard technique in quantum statistical mechanics and quantum thermodynamics in condensed matter. And what what standardly gets then is a Lindblad type evolution for the quantum field that's coupling to this coarse grain environment, and characteristically, in fact, it's a non-unitary non evolution that's characteristic of an open system you know, coupled to an environment. The other way of doing it is um, to take what I will call the TBD gravitational degrees of freedom and integrate them out from the coupling with the, with the quantum field. And as you might guess, I'm calling them the TBD degree, gravitational degrees of freedom because they are TBD. They are to be determined. No one knows what gravitational, nobody knows what degrees of freedom there may be. We may, there may be to integrate out. So th this is a sta very standard technique in constructing effective field theories in say particle physics and, and in condensed matter. You argue that a, that, that, that a certain spectrum of excitations of your degrees of, of degrees of freedom of this one field 
So one type of field are relevant to the dynamics um, in this regime. So you just integrate them out and collect and collect their uh, their cumulative effects into some coupling constant. So that's what that you may think is what's being done here. The classical the classical geometry, the Newtonian the Newtonian, gra Newtonian gravitational constant. That coupling is represents all of the gravitational coupling degrees of freedom at the micro quantum level that are that are negligible at the classical at the semi classical level. So in a little more detail, coarse graining means that we treat gravity as a free physical mechanical system with micro degrees of freedom, presumably properties of some possibly perturbative quantum gravitational states, and we coarse grain in very standard physical mechanical sense. Curvature will then be a macro property that external, external systems couple with, just like heat and pressure for gases. Loss of unitarity comes about for reasons similar to why we expect, for instance, loss of repredictability for classical systems interacting with dissipative coarse grain systems. They wipe out information about initial conditions. If I have a, blocks, if I have a, bo a, block, a box sliding down an incline with friction, you, know, the, you can treat the friction of, of the incline as, exa as exactly a manifestation of the fact that we're, that in Newtonian mechanics, friction is a it comes about because we've coarse grained uh, the underlying you know, atomic structure of the incline. When the box slides to a stop, as it will, there, there's perfect predictability. I can tell you exactly where the box will stop if I fix the initial conditions. But once the box is stopped, I have com complete, that dissipation has completely wiped out all information about initial conditions. I, have, I cannot tell you where the box started with what speed up the incline if all I'm looking at is where the box is sitting after it came to a stop. That's exactly what we get here. So loss of, the, the kind of unitarity loss that we get in, in the case of, say, black hole evaporation is exactly loss of retrodictability. There's always perfect predictability. If I, if I tell you what pure state you're starting in, I can tell you exactly what mixed state what mixed thermal state you'll end up in. But if I just give you the, mixed, the, the final mixed thermal Hawking state, I cannot tell you what pure state I started in. So it's exactly the same situation. Oh, sorry. I didn't turn off my uh, email client. I'll just let it go. So there are many virtues to coarse graining. They, I think that they, they may have the possibility, uh, th this approach to treating uh, SCG as an EFT may be able to resolve some conceptual muddles, but it also may raise some new difficulties. It first of all may give a hint to the origin of the thermodynamical character of black holes when external quantum effects are taken into account. It may even give a hint for a way to explain that black holes obey thermodynamical relations, or at least, at least formally obey thermodynamical relations in classical GR. One might say, look, um, any theory of gravity, if, 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 if this coarse graining strategy to treat semi-classical gravity as, a, as an effective field theory is, is correct, then any classical theory needs to recapitulate that as, as a minimal criterion of adequacy. That's not an explanation for why, therm, for why the semi-natural behavior is there, but it, do, it, 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 can, it can tell you, look, the reason why classical GR, why the four laws of black hole mechanics say show up already in classical GR it's just, because GR, it's just because GR is a good theory of the way the world really is. Any good theory, the way, any good theory of, the way, of the way the world really is at the classical level needs to, re, needs to recapitulate this behavior that we think holds true at the, the semi-classical level. That, of course, there's a, possible, there's a possible problem with that. It's not clear why, gen, why general relativity could be adequate in some regimes in which the, the seemingly thermodynamical nature of gravity is totally irrelevant. You know, the four laws of black hole mechanics have no bearing on solar system predictions, gravitational waves, or cosmology. So why couldn't we have a really good theory of gravity, of classical gravity that worked for, in those cases, but which got the thermodynamical character of gravity completely wrong, if we're, say, for black holes? Most interestingly, perhaps, and most tantalizingly, uh, treating the EFT as, a, um, as coarse graining might dissolve the information loss paradox, because it would show decisively why loss of unitarity at the semi-classical level need not imply anything about dynamics and more fundamental levels. It, need not, it doesn't need to cascade down to more fundamental, more fundamental level of quantum gravity. We can pinpoint why, why unitarity is lost. It's because we're, we've coarse grained out um, all the degrees of freedom, the um, reimposition of which would at least possibly restore unitarity. 
And I already mentioned the issue that we retain predictability and lose retrodictability, which is exactly what happens with black hole evaporation. It still may provide guidance to quantum gravity. We just look for the gravitational microdegrees of freedom whose statistics give the kind of coarse grained environment required for both for the thermodynamics of black holes and for the semi-classical Einstein field equation. But the problem is, is that it's really hard to see how this could explain the fact that the classical geometry couples to the expectation value of the stress energy operator. It may give an explanation for why the coherence of the quantum gravitational state should restrict the, uh, I'm sorry, that, uh, that should be quantum field state, should restrict adequacy of semi-classical approximation because plausibly only such coherent states will give rise to thermodynamically stable environments under coarse grain in the first place. If we treat the EFT as um, integrating uh, as the, uh, by the integrating out mechanism, and I'll stop in two minutes, we treat quantum field, the quantum field's degrees of freedom as coupling with something like perturbative quantum gravitational degrees of freedom. We integrate we then integrate out from the interaction, the TBD gravitational degrees of freedom as in the completely standard way in standard EFT frameworks in particle physics and condensed matter. And I say that we, that the, these TBD degrees of freedom have to be something like perturbative degrees of freedom because we don't expect in no project account program of quantum gravity that people are working on today, is it the case that fundamental quantum gravity degrees of freedom couple with relatively gross macroscopic matter of the form that is given by standard quantum fields in the standard model of particle physics. So if we are going to if we are going to treat semi-classical gravity as an effective field theory using standard integrate using standard techniques of integrating out degrees of freedom, the gravitational degrees of freedom we integrate out have to be perturbative ones, not fundamental ones. That already of course raises some problems because it's hard to see how to characterize TBD now. It can't, they can't be UV modes because the gravitational field has no high energy modes in the relevant cases. Gravity is just incredibly weak compared to, gravitational energy is incredibly weak compared to quantum fields in many, many, in many, many relevant cases. It can't be IR because we want to be, we want to, uh, to, use, we want to use semi-classical gravity as in fact it is used in space times that are arbitrarily close to Minkowski space time. The only possibility that I can see that's left is that we're going to integ integrate out something like low entropy modes, low entropy uh, compared to characteristic entropy of the standard quantum field states. Now, it's not even clear to me what that might mean, but the reason I'm even suggesting it is because it is, a, it is the effectively high gravitational entropy as compared to the entropy of, of the quantum fields that characterizes the relevant cases of interest in which we actually apply the semi-classical gravity framework. But that is a severely non-standard form of effective field theory, and I have no idea even how to, how to characterize that, much less implement it. Prima facie, we get no relief in the information loss paradox. Standard EFTs can, in principle, violate unitarity, but only when the dynamics tries to probe the phase space regions that have, that have been integrated out, i.e. when the coupling energy, the effective coupling energies become large. But that's not what happens in black hole evaporation, at least not for big black holes with effectively flat curvature and infinitesimal Hawking temperature, but that's what we still use semi-classical gravity for that. If, the low end, if we can make sense of the idea of integrating out low entropy modes, there may be relief because it is exactly those modes that quantum field degrees of freedom are trying to probe if one assumes a form of coupling in which mode by mode interaction is governed by respective entropies, not respective energies, but this is now wildly speculative. No such coupling is known for any other type of field. And it would seem impossible to govern such a uh, coupling with a Hamiltonian because energy isn't governing the dynamics and quantum entry is not a self-adjoint operator. And it's not obvious how to make it one. If one could make some, if one could answer these questions, then because the TBD modes are integrated out from the interaction, there may be some hope of explaining the coupling of the class Einstein tensor to the expectation value of the stress energy, but that's just wildly speculative and brushing with a very broad stroke. There may be some hope, but that is a very, very etiolate hope at the moment. And it's extremely difficult to see why the coherence of the quantum gravitational state should be a restriction on the adequacy of the semi-classical approximation. My sense is that coarse graining wins on virtues and demerits, but because it's so hard to even get a grip on what the integrating out strategy might come to, I, I, don't, I, I don't want to say that with any real confidence. 
But if, in, in, in any case, if, if say we are able to argue with, uh, with some confidence that one of the two approaches really wins on virtues and demerits, what would that tell us about the conceptual structure of semi-classical gravity and its standing as a viable, possibly fruitful physical framework? I'm not sure. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Excellent. So we have about half an hour for uh, Q&A. Who would like to go first? So far, I see nobody in. Well, I take it that means that everyone was completely, that I was perfectly clear and everyone was completely convinced by it. Yes, Fantastic. that's what it means. Um, but maybe still, even though you were clear, maybe it didn't answer all the questions and there may be some remaining ones. Okay, so I, I see a hand by Nick. Nick, please. Thanks, Eric. It was, yeah, so really, uh, yeah, really enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, can I talk, I want to talk, talk a bit about the coherence issue that you raised, because that's something I've kind of thought and talked about, and maybe we even talked a bit about that. I remember when we met in Hyde Park a year or so ago. We did, we did, we did talk about it, in fact. Yeah. So I don't remember if this, some of these are the things we talked about then, or just to sort of go over again, uh, anyway, or, or some sort of new sorts of thoughts. So... Yeah, um, and maybe you've just been talking to Garosh about that example, I don't know, because I guess that's why you were in, in Chicago. I mean, so for the book that I'm writing with Chris, I've kind of been writing, there's, I, there's a pretty long appendix that I've kind of tried to put together on these sort of ideas about um, how sort of coherence, the co coherent state sort of approach to quantum field theory as an understanding of um, a classical limit in quantum field theory, how we get classical fields out. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then to sort of see if that works um, as an idea, as a way of understanding a classical gravitational field. I mean, this is coming from the string theory approach. Mm -hmm. um, so I take it that's what you have in mind. This doesn't have to do with sort of deco the opposite of decoherence. This is about having something that's kind of peaked, like some kind of Gaussian or something like that. That's exactly in right. state space, right? <laughs> Thank, thank you for clarifying that. That's exactly right. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know. So a couple of things, I, I don't know. I sort of have kind of a list and then maybe there's a sort of question at the end, you know. So, you know, Kiefer has some work on this. So mm -hmm. the pro framework he takes is to sort of work in quantum cosmology um, and sort of, you know, model a black kind of, you can sort of model a black hole with a sort of Gaussian state. And you do the, there's a paper where, which actually, um, Niels Linneman pointed out to me where you do the calculation and, you know, not too surprisingly, you, the black hole quantum, you know, that state kind of remains coherent um, for something like the Hawking time, okay, which is kind of what you would sort of expect. Um, that's not a very sophisticated definition of kind of, he doesn't use a very, I think if I remember right, a very sophisticated de definition of what coherent sort of, you know, coherent state means there. It is a Gaussian and you just look for when the width of the Gaussian, whatever doubles or some, I don't know, whatever nut parameter you sort of put in there. Um, yeah, I mean, it's sort of order of magnitude thing. Um, but then he also has examples of sort of bouncing universes where you lose coherence much more quickly, it sort of, it seems. Um, you had the sort of exploding earth volume example, but there's also this sort of, it seems to me sort of similar, this um, Zurich and Paz. This comes from David Wallace's book, the example of Hyperion, um, which is I can't remember, one, of, one of the moons of one of the outer, you know, outer planets. Um, his point is that so many of the systems that you're looking at where you're trying to model classically are, are chaotic systems. So you actually get deco you, you actually get a loss of coherence very quickly. They, they claim in the calculation that it just takes a few decades for the for the um, coherence to break down, even for sort of moons because it's such a chaotic system. Um, so that's kind of bad for this sort of coherent, you know, coherent state classical limit picture of gravity. But I guess my sort of general question is from the the things in particular. 
um, you were, so I hope some of that's sort of helpful kind of parameters for things I've sort of discovered in this, in, in asking that very question. Um, I've also talked to a bunch of people and, you know, I, I, I even, I communicated a little bit with Weinberg because it was interesting when he was doing the work on um, getting GR out of quantum field theory. So his work on sort of quantum, gra you know, quantum gravity as quantum field theory was about the same time as, um, uh, oh, now I'm forgetting who it is, the, the work in sort of in quantum optics and the idea of a coherent state was being developed kind of in the 60s. But people I've talked to from that time, those things never came together in any way to sort of see if, you know, you know, those ideas would apply. Anyway, um, but I agree, nobody seems to have any precise kind of, you know, notions about this. Whereas, you know, while the string theorists and other people in the sort of quantum field theory approach to gravity are pretty happy to just say, oh, it's a coherent state and, and leave it at that. Um, it, I don't, I don't, I haven't really found anything where anyone's really worked that out in any serious way. But I, so anyway, to come to the question is, are these issues particular to, to gravity? Or is this just a more general sort of feature of, it's really a bit unclear how to take a classical limit in um, quantum field theory at all? I mean, I guess if you were Wallace, you would go for a many worlds kind of view of things, but whether coherent states are really a plausible way of understanding a classical limit of quantum field theory, sort of in any case, all right, that was the question. So I, um, I want to say, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for that excellent list of, um, of instances of, of, of related discussions of, of, this, of this issue in, in the literature. So I'm familiar with Kiefer's work. Um, I'm a little, not, not as familiar as you, I'm sure, but a little familiar with, the, with how this plays out in string theory. Um, I haven't really thought about the, the, the Weinberg field theoretic approach to gravity. But from what you say, that it, it does seem clear how coherence m must play a role in trying to trying to derive the classical limit there. Um, the but the final question, I, I think that there is something that the the I think there is something distinctively difficult that that, are, that arises here that, that is peculiar to the semi classical uh, gravity the semi classical gravity situation. And it comes back to this issue of the expectation value of the stress energy tensor as being the right hand side of the semi classical equation. The fact that it's, a, it's a, the reason why coherence is demanded is because we want that expectation value to be, to in some sense track what is, what is, what state the gravitational field is most likely to be in if it is in an eigenstate, if it is in a stress energy eigenstate. It's, but you, you mentioned um, you know, uh, Wallace and, and many worlds. I actually, as far as I can tell, this is a problem that is actually even, that is, that is actually more severe for many worlds than it would be, for instance, for a, a dynamical collapse um, interpretation or for a Bohmian. I never thought I would say that, but a Bohmian might actually be preferred here, which is that, uh, for God's sake, please don't mention that to, to, to Tim. No, no one tell Tim I said that. So, because the expect, the expect, how can the expect, in the, in the, in the many worlds interpretation, you know, at, at, at the semi-classical level, there, the, the effective, it makes sense to treat the effective branching as, as in some sense real. That's, we're, we're at that level of approximation. So in what sense can what's happening in another branch possibly determine space-time geometry in this branch? That, that's what the, the expectation value simply is an averaging over you know, all the values in all the branches. How can, the, how can what's happening over there possibly tell me what space-time geometry, in that branch, possibly tell me what space-time geometry is doing here? So I actually, I actually do think that without having thought very deeply about it, I my gut reaction, my, my, my first instinct is to, which I will not want to declaim with any confidence until I talk to someone, for instance, like Wallace, is that most, is that many worlds does face a pretty severe problem. But in any event, the, the answer to your question is, I think, that what is problematic is making sense of why it's the expectation value on the right hand side and what that means physically.
that I think gives a gives a peculiar a peculiarity to this problem that I don't think is faced in other cases of trying to extract a classical limit from from a quantum field. But I could be wrong about that. Okay. So maybe other cases where you sort of have a quantum particle, you you just have a fully classical background with no back reaction or something like that. It's because of the you're trying exactly. to put a back reaction in that you get into this. Uh, exactly. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks again for the talk. That was really interesting. Okay. Uh, Sakshi. Hi, Professor Curiel. Thank you very much for your talk. I'm also working on the information loss paradox. So much of what you said is definitely going to be helpful for my work. I am really glad you brought up the quantum assault on classical causal structure and how most of GR's fundamental theorems get undermined. So I have a clarification question around that. One of those theorems is a no-hair theorem, you said, which is critical for black hole thermodynamics. And I was wondering if you go the step further and buy into black hole statistical mechanics, on that level, it's certainly not critical, correct? So um, I, just, I just want to get clear. When you say black hole quantum statistical mechanics, do you, um, do you mean that uh, it, it, that phrase seems to me ambiguous? It could mean at least one of two, uh, two things. The first is I'm going to treat black holes as something like quantum particles, and I can then uh, bring to bear the standard machinery of quantum statistical mechanics on ensembles of black holes thusly treated. Or you might mean I'm going to treat an individual black hole um, as, being, um, as being in a particular quantum state, no matter what, given some particular theory of quantum gravity. But because but for various reasons, because of black hole thermodynamics, it is most convenient, or uh, at least at the level of, at the level of approximation we're dealing with, most uh, meaningful to treat the state of the black hole as being, in fact, a you know a distribution over possible states in the sense, say, of Gibbsian uh, statistical mechanics, but you know using the machinery of quantum statistical mechanics. So, did you mean the former or the latter? I mean the former, as they do in string theory. Okay. Um, then I got so caught up in trying to resolve the ambiguity. I'm sorry, I forgot your question. Can you please ask it again? No problem. So I guess the motivation behind my question is how critical is something like the no hair theorem if many physicists do believe that a black hole is a quantum system with microscopic constituents that has you know, multiple microstates and you use the machinery of quantum statistical mechanics. Got it. Okay, um, so then if you're dealing with an ensemble of, of quantum black holes and you don't have available a no-hair theorem, then I don't even see how you're going to, how you're going to apply this, the machinery of standard quantum statistical mechanics because that machinery, um, to the best of my knowledge, the only way I know how to, the only way I know it and know how to use it is when the, the, the micro constituents of the, you know, of the quantum ensemble that you're dealing with have a finite, have a finite number of degrees of freedom. But that will not, if you lose the null hair theorem, uh, for, as, you do, as you do, for instance, when you have non-abelian gauge theories, then you know, uh, in fact, generically, all, all the cases I know in which uh, no, hair, no hair theorems are lost, not only is it the case that you know that the black holes are no longer characterized by a finite and small number of degrees of freedom. So you, you might think, okay, well, no, no hair fails. Maybe it's just that instead of three you know, numbers, I need 16 numbers to characterize a black hole. Nope, you never get that. It, go, it's either, it's, it seems to be either three or infinite. And I don't know how to apply quantum statistical mechanics to an ensemble of systems that each of which has an infinite number of degrees of freedom. There, maybe there's some way, that, and I'm just ignorant of that, um, so that, but I, I, I don't know of any way to do it. The issue that you mentioned about um, the classical causal structure possibly breaking down, that is not directly related to the uh, failure of the no hair theorems, but is indirectly related because if you don't have a well-defined event horizon, it's not clear what 
parameter, what small finite set of parameters you can find to characterize the, the state of the black hole because it's not clear what space-time structure you want to be attributing numbers to in the first place. So there, there's also that issue. That's really helpful. Thank you so much. Uh, Julius. Um, actually, my first question would lead us to something super similar to what Sakshi said, namely, why would violation of no her theorems for non-abelian gauge theories bother me any more in the semi-classical context than it would in classical context. Um, so I don't know if that way of phrasing would change anything in your, in your answer. This, this just doesn't seem to me to be a kind of specific to the semi-classical gravity uh, problem. So, if, um, if you're asking why it is that that uh, that loss of no hair, not, not just loss of no hair, but loss of like radical loss of no hair, yeah. but you've gone from ball to infinite infinite numbers of hair, uh, or three you've gone from three strands of hair to infinite numbers of hair. This um, why that's problematic in the in the in the semi-classical version. Well, because. Let's not think about well, that. I guess, I guess I would like to know whether you think it's any more problematic in the semi-classical regime than it is in I the do. classical I do. regime. So if, um, if, if, you if, you, if you, like almost everyone, thinks that it really makes sense to talk about black hole thermodynamics in the semi-classical case, but it doesn't make sense to, re to treat black holes as truly thermodynamical systems in the classical case, then, then, it is mu then uh, loss of no hair is much, should be much more prevalent to you in the semi-classical case. Loss of it in the in the classical case, yeah, who cares? Um, so it turns out that there's many more black hole solutions than uh, you know, Schwarzschild, Kerr, Horizon Nordstrom, and uh, Kerr Newman. Well, great, we now have a lot more solutions to play with. That's fun. Mm -hmm. But in the semi-classical case, we have black hole thermodynamics. If uh, putting aside the issue of thinking about ensembles of black holes, as you know, a, a system like a black hole gas composed of 10 to the 23rd black holes. Put that aside. Let's just think of a single black hole as a system in which we're going to take, which we're as a gravitational, uh, pure gravitational system, which we're going to take uh, quantum effects into account of of uh, quantum effects um, excited by the external by the propagation of external quantum fields. So. One of the most characteristic features of a thermodynamical system to me is that it is, its state is characterized by, by a not only finite, but small number of macro parameters. So mm -hmm. this on standard, uh, standard thermodynamical treatments, if I treat this, the water in my bottle as a classical thermodynamical system, I can completely characterize it by two numbers, say it's, vol its volume and its temperature, or its entropy and its energy. I only need two numbers. I don't care about what's happening at the micro level. That's what gives thermodynamics its power. If you're telling me that I, that I no longer need, that I, that I no longer can get by with three numbers to characterize a black hole, but I need an infinite number of numbers to characterize a black hole, that's first of all, it first of all makes it problematic to interpret a black hole as a thermodynamical system in any ordinary sense of that term. You might not, so you might, you might say, well, that's just too bad. Already, it turns out where it works, as often happens when you extend old concepts into new physical regimes, we are going to change the meaning. It turns out that the meanings of old concepts have to be extended, amended, modified, and perhaps even radically rewritten from top to bottom. So thermodynamics used to mean characterized by a small number of parameters. Thermodynamics now has been extended to include characterized by infinite number of parameters. Well, it's not it's not only that, but um, the but when, when there is when you have a infinite number of parameters, the calculation of the Hawking temperature becomes um, and the calculation of the Bekenstein entropy both become ambiguous because it's not if if you're taking account of the infinite hair that comes along from the effects of these external quantum fields, 
then that means that Vekenshine, the calculation of Vekenshine entropy has to take account of the logarithmic corrections that come about from the from the excitations of the um, of the event horizon from the ambient quantum field modes. But that calculation becomes ambiguous when you have an imp when the when you the black hole is no longer care when when you can no longer restrict the classical contribution of entropy to the area. You now, you now all of a sudden have to try and take into account uh, the contributions from all these other parameters. The same thing happens for the calculation of the Hawking spectrum. The calculation becomes ambiguous. So it really does seem to call into question the entire the entire cogency of black hole thermodynamics if you lose if you lose the null air theories. I see. And so then the because in classical GR, I can just dismiss those solutions because I don't, I have no uh, classical non-abelian gauge fields, at least you seem not yeah, to have and, ones. And in classical he, approximation, he, I couldn't run these sorts of arguments. He, he, and if, if you were excruciatingly clever and managed to produce a classical non-abelian gauge field of, um, in some sense or other and lost no hair in the, in the purely classical case, again, as long, if you don't take thermodynamics for black hole seriously in, in the classical case, then your your as far as I'm concerned, your reaction should be, wow, that's totally awesome. We have a lot more black hole solutions to play with. But that Chris, could they have a slight follow up to this? Um, so, would you? What if someone like you uh, say to all of this, since you seem to take classical black hole thermodynamics seriously? This is just like the missing piece of the of the puzzle for me. So, um, are you, I guess the question is: Are you seriously bothered by the loss of uh, no hair theorems in these cases? So I personally am not because um, I take I take uh, on those days when I do take classical black hole thermodynamics seriously. And I, I don't I don't do it every day. I tend I tend to go back and forth on it. But on those days when I do take it seriously, then I take it seriously in the way that I take ordinary thermodynamics seriously. Ordinary thermodynamics is not applicable to every possible situation. It's not, it's not applicable to every possible configuration of matter. It's not applicable to every possible state of matter in any given, in, in, as coupled to any given environment. There are a lot, there are many, when, if you, it's really quite easy if you couple seemingly classical thermodynamical systems to manifestly quantum environments. It's extremely easy to violate the second law. It's extremely easy to seemingly violate the second law, perhaps I should say, and to do all the things that people complain about when they complain uh, that, class, that classical black holes have no uh, well-defined thermodynamical theory. So, I would, I would, on those days when I do take classical black hole thermodynamics seriously, I would simply say, uh, I'm just as in classical thermodynamics, I'm not going to, uh, I, I run into trouble when I couple classical thermodynamical systems to manifestly quantum systems about taking proper account of, um, of, of the classical nature, of the quantum nature of the coupling. Same thing, hap same thing happens with classical black holes. If I'm coupling a classical black hole to what is manifestly a quantum, what is manifestly a quantum field, no matter how classical I try to make it look, yeah, it's going to fail. So I'm, I'm not very worried about it. Thank you. That was extremely yeah. helpful. Thanks. Thank you very much. I have a, a follow up on this. Uh, so much of this was really sort of started out from. Uh, what you called in your slides the problem of causal structure and you know given the the various back and forths we've now had it seemed to me that it's not this is not it, it, is it really a problem of causal structure I, I guess is my question or is it more a, a problem of the coherence of black hole thermodynamics so I'm sorry, I missed the very last thing you said. Is it a problem of causal structure or is it a problem of? Of something like the coherence of black hole thermodynamics or something like that. 
I would be, I, um, it is, so I agree, it is a problem only in so far, the, the idea that there's not a well, uh, there's not a well-defined classical background causal geometry is a problem only in so far as that kind of structure is assumed in many, in many calculations and uh, many models in black hole thermodynamics. So it's, for instance, it's not clear to me that the, that the kind of indeterminacy one might worry one, one might worry arises here in the background in the background causal geometry would really cause any problems for say the calculation of the distribution of anisotropies in the cosmic microwave background radiation. That is that's another that's another place where uh, QFT and on CST is used and seems to be used incredibly successfully. And I, I, off the top of my head, I don't, I don't see, it's not, it's not obvious to me that the kind of indeterminacy that is, that is problematic here, that maybe, that may arise here, I should rather say, would cause a problem for that kind of calculation. It's also not clear to me that this kind of indeterminacy would, would cause a problem for inflationary models, which is another place where uh, that is, Effect, that is effectively uh, another uh, physical uh, system that is effectively modeled in, this, in the framework of QFT on CST and, and even more um, ambitious inflationary models even, even in the semi-classical framework. Now, the problem really comes about as I, uh, this, this seems to be a problem. So there's one, there's one there, this seems to be problematic for, for two reasons. One, it just seems to call into question the coherency of the, of the, of the semi-classical picture as formulated, because it is always the case that one assumes a fixed background a causal geometry, classical causal geometry. So there's just a conceptual worry, is this a coherent framework in and of itself? And then there's the more applied, there's the more applied worry, if you like, oh, well, wait a minute, if uh, I actually depend on this fixed background classical causal structure to do things like calculate Hawking flux and calculate Hawking radiation, but the character of Hawking radiation itself, at least on some on some on the picture that some derivations give you, calls into question the determinacy of this causal structure that I've been that I've been relying on the entire time. So there's a general there's a general worry about coherency of the whole framework just in the abstract. There's a particular worry about how that indeterminacy might make particular derivations and pictures of Hawking radiation incoherent. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, Ravad. Uh, yes, hi, thank you. Uh, I think it's a bit related to your question. I'm not sure, but it's a general question about the inconsistency claims that uh, you were mentioning, Eric, during the talk. So when you say GR is inconsistent with QFT and QFT is inconsistent with GR, do you mean that these the they share theoretical statements in their general form or contradict one another, or are they just inconsistent in the sense that when you apply them to a particular case, you derive a reason which is in contradiction with one of them? So I mean something quite imprecise and hazy when I say they're inconsistent. And I don't I I very often shy away from using the word inconsistent because I don't I don't in fact think that there is any inconsistent in a strong logical sense. And one, you know, one uh, proof of that, if you like, is the existence of, of a perfectly rigorous, uh, the perfectly rigorous framework of, of, of algebraic quantum field theory on curved space time. They can't really be inconsistent if, 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 that, if there's that theory. Um, there, there, there seems to be to be manifest tension, if, if, if you like, between the two of them in the following sense. Each has fundamental physical principles that it seems in, extremely difficult to see how to implement in the other. So one of the fundamental physical principles of quantum mechanics is superposition. I have no idea what it means to talk about a superposition of, say, null cone structure in GR. GR, has, one of its fundamental physical principles seems to be um, a, an app, a, a, a libertine attitude towards possible causal structures. I have no idea how to implement that in quantum field theory, given uh, things like unitarity of evolution and the standard static 
uh, fixed geometry that quantum field theory is generally formulated on. Uh, one, in fact, can might, might go even further and say that insofar as one can make sense of something like the principle of equivalence in GR, and I'm actually not, a, I'm not a big fan of the principle of equivalence. It's not clear to me that there is anything like a clear rigorous formulation that actually holds true in the theory. I tend to suspect there's not, but let's be generous and say that there is like a tolerably clear principle that smells like the principle of equivalence that actually holds true in the theory. It would be very difficult to see how that could hold true in, uh, in quantum mechanics, um, at, least without a, at least without a lot of manipulation of the notions of inertial mass and gravitational mass and their equivalents in the presence of superposition and, entang and entanglement. So there are, fun there are fundamental physical principles in each theory that it's difficult to see how they implement in the other. That's, that is really what I mean when I very loosely talk about their, their mutual inconsistency. Okay, thanks. Oh, okay, uh, Radin. So, th thanks, Eric. I, I have a very broad question, very general question. Um, there were all the time notions, and since you just talked about it, about consistency, coherence, cogency, the rigor, uh, and clarity of the formulations, et cetera. And you linked all of those to some extent to why we should not trust uh, that approach. And I'm just kind of want to understand why one needs to link those, right? In some sense, if I take uh, the standard model of particle physics, none of these applies to some extent, and it's the most trustworthy the theory we have. Right, so I'm just if I think in about trustworthiness and in, in the sense of making uh, reliable predictions, uh, rigor and so on, these are not the kind of criteria I would want to uh, that I necessarily would apply in that context. Right, so when I was listening to your the set of problems, I found that all of them really interesting, but I understood them as in some sense sources of. Uh, heuristic guidance of how to develop something new or kind of make uh, develop new theories out rather than any of those put, putting distrust about the results of that theory. What would be wrong with this kind of interpretation of your, your set of problems? Um, so uh, short answer is uh, I think nothing at all because I, 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 perhaps I was not, I probably almost certainly was not clear enough and what claims I was making and what claims I was not making. I was not claiming we should not trust the framework. I was rather claiming that there are, that there, that there are prima facie reasons that would make it reasonable not to trust it. I'm not, I'm not telling you anything at all about whether I think you should or should not trust it. I'm saying here's a set of reasons that would admit that any, that would justify reasonable doubt if you, want, if you wanted to go that route. The, but there is a very serious difference though between the, 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 fact, the fact that standard, you know, standard quantum field theory, the standard model of particle physics does in fact have, you can argue, you can you know, list all day long um, la lacks of cogency, of coherence, of inconsistencies, absolutely. And yet it works, you know, pretty, it works as well as if not better than any theory we've ever had. It's, it's hard to, it's really hard to even comprehend how well it works. It is so mind-blowingly accurate. So here we have a case where lack of cogency, lack of coherency, uh, certain kinds of inconsistency are just completely irrelevant and don't show us that we shouldn't trust the theory. Well, the, the difference is that this, in standard Q of T and the standard model, ordinary Q of T and the standard model are incredibly well empirically entrenched. What we mean when we say they're a good theory is we've tested it. We've made novel predictions. We've, we've tested old predictions. We have made novel. We've made novel predictions and tested novel predictions. It is inc when we say it's a great theory. It's a great theory because it's empirically well entrenched. Empirically well entrenched. We don't have any of that uh, for QFT and CST and semi and semi classical gravity. So when you have no when you have no empirical entrenchment at all, when you have not not just no empirical entrenchment, but you don't even have contact with experimentation. It's not that they're, uh, we've done experiments and they're, and they're bad, they, they turned out badly. We haven't even done experiments. We don't even, in this case, it does seem to me that, I, I'm not a big believer in the 
in, in, in these super empirical virtues. I, 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 I tend to be pretty old fashioned and curmudgeonly about these things. You know, in, 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 empir, empirical adequacy, that's what matters. That, to me, that trumps everything else. Your theory is ugly and not simple and has all these, you know, has all these uh, epicycles and, uh, and is, is, is hard to use. If it's empirically adequate, who cares? It's a good theory. So, but that's not the case here. So in this case, maybe we should, if we have nothing else that we can fall back on, maybe we should worry about lack of consistency and, and lack of coherence, lack of potency. Maybe not. I think that reasonable people can disagree about it, but I'm merely pointing these out as possible reasons that, re that some reasonable people might take to doubt to have to have doubt about these theories, about these frameworks. Thanks. Okay, well, please join me in thanking Eric once again. Thank you, thank you very much for sitting through it and for your great questions. And thank, 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 thank you, Chris and Nick, for the invitation. It's been really great. Well, uh, thank you for just... agreeing to do this. Uh, Nick, did you want to say something? Well, yeah, I just wanted to tie the last thing Eric said into the talk next week. It's not that the Garassi is going to provide an experiment that's going to provide evidence for um, semi-classical uh, quantum gravity. In fact, the bit that's really interesting, you know, the, the, one of the parts that's really interesting to me is actually more Popperian. If this experiment to, to show, I mean, to reveal um, gravitational superposition that his that his group, uh, the group that he's worked with has sort of described in theory and is something that I think they hope to actually realize in a lab, it would actually be a refutation of, um, uh, of uh, semi-classical quantum gravity. It would show that matter did, um, that gravity, that um, gravity did not couple to the um, expectation value of stress energy, but actually saw the superposition. So that's a plug yeah. for next week, you know. That sounds, okay. that sounds very groovy. And you'll, you'll, you'll be sending out an announcement to, uh, on the standard email list for that? Um, I already did, yeah, and it's, I, I thought it did yesterday. Oh. Um, and it's on the website as well, so, okay. so uh, I'll check, make sure it went out, so. Well, again, th yeah. th thank you very much. Hope, hope, you guys, hope you guys are well. Thank you very much, uh, that will be, uh, next Wednesday. Uh, uh, so please join us again for that. And um, thank you very much all for participating today. And um, see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.